I need to click here. The North Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have a wonderful seminar. This will be our last program for the day. I hope all of you have been able to attend it and or watch it online. If you missed any of it, it is being recorded. You can go back and watch it at your leisure. Uh, we will have it on our web, our website, and probably on YouTube, where you can pick it up at. So we did want to make sure that anybody wanted to see it would have access to it. And that's why we tried to make sure we had uh, coverage and, and put it out on the internet. Um, Barbara Sharp has just finished up her part, was excellent on the different things to keep healthy and to get healthy. And just, there are basic things that our bodies need. And if you miss out on any one of them, you're not gonna be healthy or not as healthy as you could be. So definitely go back and and see hers. And now we're going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Kelly. He is uh, an MD and a uh, lifestyle um, physician. And he is taking a different course. Instead of just uh, bringing his patients in and loading them up with medications and sending them home, he has a whole different program of making sure the body gets what it needs understanding how the body works and working with the body systems so that you can be healthy and enjoy a great life. And I love the way he started off his uh, first meeting last night was a question. How do you want to live for the next 10 years? And it shows one person taking care of themselves. They're getting up, getting dressed, going bike riding or whatever, playing with their grandkids. It shows another person, same age, who's getting up, getting his medication, coasting along in his wheelchair over to get some breakfast, and just totally different lifestyles because of how they took care of themselves. And all of the, what we're looking at, uh, the main factors that are affecting our health today are all factors that we have control over. We don't have control over genetics, but we do have control over the switches on top of the genes that turn them on and off. And that is all controlled by how we eat, how we exercise, how we take care of ourselves. And that's been a, one of the big positive moments I've seen today in the seminar. So at this time, we're going to turn to Dr. Kelly and let him finish up with this last phase of our program. Dr. Kelly? Thank you so much, Charlie. And uh, yes, so welcome to everyone, each one of you, especially some new faces. Um, yeah, so our topic, our final topic is natural remedies, the immune system, and COVID. And of course, COVID is just the current big uh, viral issue that we're facing. The fact of the matter is the country has faced other uh, pandemics that were not COVID, and we will undoubtedly face more in the future, and it may not be uh, a coronavirus. So talking about strengthening your immune response to viruses. So our learning objectives, okay, um, are to understand the beneficial effects of hydrothermal therapy on COVID-infected patients. And uh, so hydrothermal therapy, as we will explain, but anyway, uh, is using water, hydro, to ch temperature change. So using water uh, to change the temperature of the body tissues. And uh, exciting to me is that there's quite a bit of research that's actually been done on this. Uh, and interestingly enough, not by Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, number two is to know some of the simple but effective hydrothermal treatments that can improve COVID-19 and viral infection outcomes. There's, again, research on this that I'll show you. And third is to know the typical results of a lifestyle changes Com when combined with hydrothermal therapy. Because we talked about um, lifestyle programs and how they, 
the effects there on type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and so forth, we're going to look at the results from a program that combined lifestyle with hydrothermal therapy. Okay. Oh, there's a sound here. I uh, appreciate your appreciating this, but I, I want to show you this again because I knew there would be some new people. Oops, I'm trying to go backwards. Here. Let's see. Okay. Uh, can I get sound when I come up next time? What will your last 10 years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment? Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? Decide. You know, the way I'm going to spend the last 10 years of my life, I'm, just, I'm determining now, not, not in those 10 years. I'm largely, de what I'm doing now is going to determine that. Anyway, so, all right, our first one was to understand the beneficial effects, <clears throat> excuse me, beneficial effects of hydrothermal therapy on COVID-infected patients, okay? Keeping in mind that COVID is just the current viral pandemic. This same thing uh, would work, actually, and has worked for other virus pandemics. Okay, now I know this is very busy, but uh, this is the summary of what we're going to do, and then I'm going to have a slide for each one. So, so here's the main points. The scientific published evidence reveals that there's a strong innate immune response that's necessary to clear the COVID virus. There's Strong innate immune response is necessary to clear the virus. That, I'm going to explain to you hopefully so you can understand why that is an amazingly significant statement to most of what we expected. Most people expected and thought that the um, uh, immune response that was going to actually win the war on COVID-19 was what we call the adaptive, the, the T-cell kind of response. What's been surprising is to find out that it's the innate immune system that has the biggest impact on whether you get infected or not. Second point we're going to look at is the innate response is weakened or delayed, especially in those needing hospitalization. So when they've looked at COVID-infected patients, what the research shows is that they, when the innate response, immune response, is weakened or, or delayed, they, the worse it is, that delay or weakening, the more likely that person's going to have to have hospitalization. Thirdly, that the SARS-CoV-2 virus hinders early cytokine production. Cytokine is a fancy medical term that basically means a, a cytoscell kine is a signal or a molecule. So it's a molecule produced by cells to communicate with other cells. So the uh, early cytokine production is hindered by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and that then can lead to the subsequent storm, okay? The cytokine storm happens in, not everyone, but in, in mostly in people that have a very uh, serious infection and are more likely to die from it. And <clears throat> it's the cytokine storm, actually, in many cases, that actually kills the patient. Not, you might say, not the virus. But it's, it is the virus because the virus has caused that cytokine storm to occur by delaying the process. It's like, it's like if you had a, um, a you were building up pressure um, in a, something and you, and you stopped it. And you just held the, well, you might blow the pump up, right? Uh, because it's too much pressure. So when it holds back the cytokine production, it builds it up to when it's released, it's a huge storm. Okay, so let's look at this now. So... Here is a citation. Each one of these, I have the citation. So this was uh, the journal Pulmonology in April of 2021. I'll point out that that's very recent. So this is some very, very um, recent information. And what I've done is I've put the abstract up here. So 
So basically what, this is, what they said was that the clinical course in COVID-19 indicates infection control in asymptomatic patients with mild disease is probably due to innate immune response because the reason is if an effective adaptive response would not be expected or possible in the early period of infection, it would usually take two to three weeks to develop, right? Most of us are aware of that, that you, we typically say that your immune response to a new antigen, a new bug, takes two to three weeks to develop. And that's talking about this immune response specific to that germ. That's called the adaptive. But the innate immune system is the one that is working all the time in a general way about any infection. So, for example, if I get a cut um, with a dirty knife or a piece of uh, a nail or something that scratches and it cuts my skin, uh, there's organisms that enter my body at that cut. I mean, it's not always, but almost always, you can guarantee that you're getting some germs. Okay. Well, but usually we don't get an infection or have any big problem with that because of the in innate immune system. It doesn't need to know what kind of a bug, it just knows it's a bug. In fact, one of my friends, uh, uh, Neil Barnard from PCRM, he, his description is that these are the cells that shoot first and ask questions later. And so, uh, and it's good to have those around when they're, but, because they recognize any germ and take them out. Okay, but for some diseases, and really for all diseases, we have an adaptive immune response that occurs after a period of two to three weeks. It takes longer to mount up that. So, what's, so what was the key point here? The key point is that inf the infection control in asymptomatic patients, what the, the difference between an asymptomatic COVID person and a non-asymptomatic, one that has symptoms, may need to go to the hospital, turns out it appears to be the result of the innate immune system. And in those that have um, symptoms and have to go to the hospital, it appears that what has happened is their innate immune system is not able to, to fight this thing off in the first few days, and instead it, they have to wait for the adaptive immune system. Okay? Anyway, uh, so it's easier for me to read here than up there. Uh, so the antiviral innate immunity has humoral components complement and coagulation fibrinolysis systems. Fibrinolysis means uh, to break up blood clots. Because um, you may be aware that people who die from COVID, some of them are dying from blood clots, right? Because it turns out this virus affects us in a way that makes our body un, uh, not have this fibrinolysis that is able to break up the, the clots as it should. Anyway, this is all I apologize, it's very technical, but after all, it is a scientific uh, article uh, and a very complex. I'm going to try to explain it to you uh, in layered terms. If I don't succeed, feel free to ask questions and I will. But anyhow, so, um, so the innate immunity, humoral components and cellular components, okay, natural killer cells and other innate lymphocytes. So the natural killer cells, you've... I suspect you've heard about it. If you, if you read or follow very much what's been uh, shared in the news over the last year or so, natural killer cells are very important for uh, viral diseases because of what they're talking about right here. It's that early attack on the COVID before it has time to really take uh, hold and, and make such a big the longer that virus is in your body, the worse it is. You want to get it out, and the sooner the better. And the innate immune system is the first part of it. Okay, uh, I'm spending a lot of time here, but I'm trying to make so we can understand it. So the failure of that system would pave the way for uncontrolled viral replication in the airways and the mounting of an adaptive immune response, potentially amplified by an inflammatory cascade. So what this is saying is that if whatever as, uh, aspects of the COVID-19 virus infection are not cleared by the innate immune system in the first few days, would then lead to an uh, adaptive response, okay? Adaptive immune response. 
And of course, it's going to have viral replication taking place. It says uncontrolled. What it means is it's not, not as adequately controlled as, wouldn't, as it would be if the innate immune system was working more efficiently. So it's, it's only in, uncontrolled in the sense that you're, these individuals that are, that are symptomatic and have a serious infection, it turns out they have not had the typical innate immune response that the asymptomatic people have. Which would you rather have, symptomatic or asymptomatic, if you get it? <laughs> of course, we would like to have asymptomatic. Basically, you can, there are people who have had COVID had, and never knew it. They don't know they had it. Okay? And in fact, one of the, that's one of the dangers, is if, you don't, if you're healthy enough and you don't know that you have it, you still actually can spread it for a few days uh, before it's completely cleared. So even if you <laughs> say, well, I'm healthy, I don't need to worry about it. Well, but you may visit a relative or a grandparent, and they're not so healthy, and you can give them death-causing COVID infection, even though you have an asymptomatic infection. So frankly, to me, that's one of the biggest, I mean, I, I don't know whether I've had COVID or not. I suspect I have, but I haven't been tested to find out if I have or not. And um, I'll probably get that test when it comes time to take the vaccine, because if I've had it, I probably won't take the vaccine. But point is, I do recognize that since I don't know if I've had it or not, if I've been exposed or think I've been exposed, then it's smart not to go around grandma uh, for 14 days, right? Because I don't want to give her exposure. Now, that's just my own personal approach. You all can each have your own. Okay. <laughs> So, and this thing here, potentially amplified by an inflammatory cascade. So we're talking, an inflammatory cascade is the more medical term for a cytokine storm. So when, when again, keep in mind here, what we're talking about is there, the, and the reason this is newsworthy, the reason that this article has is, is, uh, gotten a considerable attention is that we had always thought that it was the adaptive immune system that was really the key to making um, us gain the victory over this virus. And, and in a way, it ultimately it is. You will get, you will get um, adaptive immune res, um, response that will allow your body to have a much better fight against it after you've had it or you've had the uh, vaccination. But it turns out that, that it's surprising to many of the experts that the innate immune system has such a critical impact early on. Severe COVID-19 appears due, to be due not only to viral infection, but also dysregulated immune and inflammatory response. And that's what we were saying about the cytokine storm. All right, let's look at the, a little bit more about this paper. So don't you love these beautiful pictures? I wish, so here, let me help you understand what this is saying. There's only two key things we, I wanted you to get out of this figure. Uh, so the infection occurs here. This is a timeline, okay, is what that is. And each one of these, little lines represent a day. See, so here's seven days, 14 days. So from the infection point, they're showing what happens, okay, in certain times. So in the first, from the very beginning, the innate immune response here, so dendritic cells, macrophages, natural killer cells, that's what these little abbreviations mean. And so these are the, the key cells that are involved in innate immunity. These cells do not care whether you're an, uh, an AIDS virus or, or you're a you know, pneumonia virus or you're a COVID virus, they just know you don't belong here, we're taking you out. And so, so some people have described it this way. The innate immune system is like a blunt instrument, okay? It's like using a baseball bat instead of a scalpel. So it's, it's very deadly, it's very heavy, but it's not you know, pinpointing to the specific. Uh, all right. Then you can see in this, the way they've drawn this, the adaptive immune response is starting here around the fifth day or so. Uh, that's, I, I, I would argue that most of the evidence indicates it's closer to seven days before that starts happening. But anyway, and this is a B cell that's producing antibodies, okay? T helper one cell uh, and T reg cells. This is a, a type of cell that is helping to regulate the immune system, if you will. So, uh, all right, here's what this is showing. That in the first few days, five or six days, uh, the innate immune response is mounted. After that, 
things start to turn over then more to the adaptive immune. And what they're saying is that the research is showing that when this, that this portion right here is what makes the difference largely between asymptomatic patient and a, and a symptomatic patient. Okay? Um, yeah, there's a whole lot more in there, but we don't have to try to pull all, tease all that out. All right, here's a simpler diagram. That was a, that's a joke. So anyway, this, this is kind of complicated, but let me explain it too. <laughs> so, so what we're talking about here is, uh, this is looking at the innate immunity, okay, from here up, and this is adaptive, okay, below that. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to blow up this little part of the uh, description so you can see it, all right? So let's read, uh, read it. What, it, what does the uh, comment say? So unlike the normal antiviral response with increased interferon type 1 and type 3, and with it the activation of genes stimulated by interferon in adjacent cells, so this, is, this is, would be the normal response, and thereby increasing its antiviral defense, the coronavirus has mechanisms that lower this antiviral innate defense mechanism by interfering with interferon production and its effects. All right, so let's just stop. And what, did we, what did we just read? Hello, folks. Glad you're here. So, so we're looking at the innate immune uh, response in, uh, to a viral COVID virus infection. So what that sentence that we just read there says is that in a normal situation, with a normal innate immune function, you see these kinds of things, increased interferon, activation of genes stimulated by interferon, this is the epigenetic switches, uh, and, uh, and increasing its antiviral defense. So, so in a healthy, normal, innate immune response to a virus is to produce interferon and signals that tell adjacent cells, you know, we've got, a, we've got an enemy here and we need to take care of it, right. But interestingly enough, the coronavirus has mechanisms that lower this antiviral defense mechanism. How? By interfering with interferon production and its effects. This is a bad thing. <laughs> interferon is a key signaling uh, cytokine in your body uh, that the immune system uses to signal to its diff different components. You know, hey, we need it. Got a problem here. In a, all right, it goes on. In addition, chemotactic molecules, these are molecules that cause uh, their chemical signals that cause other cells to come to your aid. It's okay. So it's like, um, you know, a um, radio signal. Need help. You know, send, send back up. So chemotactic molecules are released in a viral infection that attract macrophages, okay? Natu and that's a typo. That's supposed to be a, a, z a zero with a slash in it. But anyway, natural killer cells and neutrophils, all of these are white blood cells, this reaction is not fully achieved during early infection with coronavirus. So the initial innate immune response appears incomplete and slow. That's, that's really in most of us, but some it's much worse. After this first innate response, adaptive immunity is triggered via activation of dendritic cells. So dendritic cells are the particular kind of immune cells that basically signal to the natural killer and to the other cells, okay, we. It's, there's enough virus here, enough load that you need to, to get active. So I'm going, I went back so you can see the picture again. So that's what they're saying is that all of these processes here lead to the activation of these innate. But if this is delayed, then we end up going into the adaptive. And as, it, as we pointed out, one of the problems with uh, interfering with the production of interferon is there is then a slowing of the inflammatory uh, response to the point that you could think of it as pressure builds up and when finally the cytokines are released it becomes a storm it becomes too much and the body is injured by this over uh, action of the because inflammation is actually part of your body's healing process, part of the signaling process. It does have collateral damage. It injures tissue, but it's a lot better to have uh, inflammation and live than to have no inflammation and die. At least most of us would think that way. So, so now, 
uh, I want to show you a study where they looked at hydrothermal therapy in COVID patients. So, so the first two that I showed you, the first two studies, and it was like three or four slides there, is helping you to see that there's documented evidence of this virus being able to interfere with the innate immune system, right? That was, that was the take home of, of the, what I just did. Okay, now we're gonna move to a second point. And this is, they've done studies on the use of hyperthermal therapy, okay? I, this is hydrothermal, that means using water to, of hot or cold, so, you know, changing. But hyperthermal is specifically high temperature. So this is high temperature therapy using hot water shown to strengthen innate immunity, the very part of the immune system that can clear the virus, okay? And the citations for that are these two, and we're gonna look at this more. So these are papers, what, uh, 2020 uh, and 20, 2002. Uh, and then there were reports of hyperthermal therapy, fomentation for the Spanish flu reveal great benefits. And so there's two papers in the literature that have cited the results of fomentations used during the Spanish flu pandemic, this one and this one here. Uh, this was published, oh, well, this is 1919, but the paper that cites it, I guess, is this 2020 paper. So, all right. So let's, let's uh, did I go too far? Nope, okay, I didn't. I just thought I went too far. All right, so, all right, monocyte is a white blood cell, okay? Uh, it's macrophage is one type, there's other types. A natural killer cell is a monocyte. So human monocytes are stimulated by experimental whole body hyperthermia. So what they're doing here is we're looking at a study, um, Zeller, Zellner, 2002, <clears throat> where they did, uh, they heated individuals uh, with well, they actually used water therapy. Some, in some of them, they also used um, sauna, hot sauna. But anyway, they elevated the body temperature. See what it says, whole body hyperthermia. And what they found was that the thermal effect of fe fever, and of course, this is all written by, um, from the evolutionary standpoint. Don't let that bother you. Uh, all you have to do is substitute there, creator's wisdom or whatever. But anyway, the thermal effect of fever, an evolutionary evolutionarily conserved, which means simply that it has been passed on, in the evolution theory, it's been passed from one being in one form to the next, okay? Um, so I, I actually believe that it's something that God built into all mammals and it wasn't evolutionary conserved. But anyway, acute phase response. So, so uh, the thermal effect of fever um, is an acute phase response that's that is, exists in all mammals, and it's been associated with better survival and shorter duration of disease in cases of infection. And not specifically COVID, but infection in general. So that's uh, what's being in, in this paper here. So if you want to get uh, this kind of information and read it for yourself, the primary literature, that would be good, and I can give uh, get you that. We, I will be making available the PDF of my uh, slides so you will be able to see all this information we want to go into it deeper. All right, the molecular consequence of the benefits of fever uh, is poorly understood uh, and it still is. This was written in 2002 but it still is. Uh, it's interesting, you know when I was a physician or being trained as a physician um, and I, like all doctors, I uh, did my residency, and in residency you could work in the hospital and you see patients and so forth. And uh, one of the things I learned early on, uh, well, maybe not early enough, but fairly early on, <clears throat> was that in a patient that has infection or anything that is affecting the temperature, you can save yourself having to be called by the nurse and get up out of bed if you will write an order that says administer aspirin when the temperature goes above a certain amount. So you save yourself, because if you don't write that, when the patient has a fever, goes above 100.4 uh, Fahrenheit, they're gonna go and call the resident on duty and say, what should I do? So if you have put a note in the chart that says, if it goes above that, administer aspirin, only call me if it goes above 101, then you can keep on sleeping longer. Well, anyway, so 
That's standard protocol. That's the point of that story was to tell you. It's standard protocol in medicine to tamp down fever. We now know that's probably a mistake most of the time. It's good for sleep, but not good for the patient. Okay? So, so I don't write those kind of orders anymore uh, because actually we are, what this research is suggesting is that we may in the future actually write an order to increase the, body, the patient's body temperature and between this, this range and that range, I don't know, say 101 to 103. And, and uh, call me after uh, they've had time to relax, come back to take a nap and come back to their baseline and tell me, do we need to do more or not? But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's a projection. I'm not a prophet, so that might not happen. All right. To determine the influence of hyperthermia on human monocytes, white blood cells, important for recognition and elimination of pathogens. We just talked about that a little bit. 12 healthy volunteers were immersed in a 39.5 degrees Celsius, that's 103 degrees Fahrenheit, hot water bath to increase their body temperature. So this is the describing the study. All right? Don't you wish you could have been one of those? So they were healthy, which is another thing to keep in mind. All right. So we're going on here, description of the study. Expression of endotoxin receptor CD14 and complement receptor CD11B. I'm sure you know exactly what those are. It really doesn't matter. These are just things that are receptors on cells in the immune system. Okay, that's all you need to know. Increased after the hot water bath. And this simply means it was statistically significant difference, the p-value less than 05. Whereas the expression of selectin CD62L which mediates initial attachment of leukocytes at the endothelium during inflammation was downregulated after hyperthermia. So what did, we, what did we just read? So what we read was that the, the receptors that, uh, that allow the a, a bug to, let's see, this was increased. So this, the, what we're talking about here is the endotoxin receptor. Endotoxin is the uh, toxic substances that are released when a cell is, is destroyed. When, it, when the cell wall is broken, stuff from the inside the cell leaks out into the system, and those are called endotoxins. So they're harmful. Okay? And so this receptor uh, was increased, whereas the expression of this one, which mediates attachment of the leukocytes, these are good things, white blood cells, at the endothelium during inflammation was downregulated. So what this is saying is that it was a change that made it uh, less likely for the white blood cells to attach to the uh, in inflamed uh, endothelium. All right, let's keep on going. Comparable changes in white blood cell monocyte receptor expression were observed after in vitro, okay, in vitro is in the lab, in glass is what that means, uh, versus in vivo is in living tissue, hyperthermia. So a similar, they saw comparable changes in uh, the laboratory. Furthermore, three hours after in vivo, that's live hyperthermia, the response of monocytes to endotoxin was enhanced in an ex vivo lipopolysaccharide stimulation assay. That's a big fancy word for a, the accepted test, the way to test for this, okay, as expressed by a greater tumor necrosis factor alpha release. Um, we conclude that the thermal effect of fever directly activates monocytes, which increases their ability to respond to bacterial challenge. And I would add to other, to viral challenge, to the, to the extent that, that, they, that white blood cells can. Yes, sir? Are you saying it's good? It's good for the infection. It helps the immune system. Yes, sir. Yes, what this study is, is concluding is from their research with the hot water bath was that the thermal effect of fever induced with a hot bath is beneficial and it helps the monocytes to do their task. Um, it is, it would be very, I mean, it, um, there's a reason that people go to school. I mean, I probably spent three, uh, at least two years in college pre-med studying 
this, I mean, I was a biochemistry major and studying this kind of stuff, and it takes quite a while to fully understand. And I'm not, I don't think that I explained everything completely, but I'm trying to explain enough you get the gist. So, uh, but anyway, probably went into too much detail. But the bottom line is right there. We conclude. Okay. So that's, that's an article published in 2002. Now here's an interesting article that um, was published in 2020. It says, during the 1918 flu pandemic, hydrotherapy with hot water, with hot wrapping on chest and abdomen soaked in boiling water three times a day with the patient wrapped in a blanket resulted in a 300% increased survival rate. And they cite, they cite this paper here. Uh, in that paper, they cite this paper. So I gave you the citation. And here is actually a copy uh, uh, from that thing that they cite. If you were to go look this up, uh, Life and Health 1919, it's the May issue, you would see on page 103, there's a picture here of a patient that was treated in a sanitarium for the Spanish flu using fomentation. And the 300% the where did I read that up here increased survival rate of those patients that received this treatment versus those that didn't you know um, I without going I do have well yeah let me go to the next slide because I have the here's the here's the actual cover of that issue that they're citing sorry you can't read it very well and here's the con table of contents for that issue what was it May of 1919 volume 34 number 5 so what I want to tell you, because I've got a copy of that and I've read every word in it uh, more than once, it's interesting because they actually sh uh, had data from the U.S. Army and the survival rate of soldiers that were treated in the, by the U.S. Army during the Spanish flu, and they had results from, I don't know, something like four or 500 patients that were treated in, in sanitariums, and the patients... Um, in the army, they had a higher infection rate. Well, that's not real surprising, right? I mean, they were in the army, and as if you've read about it, the, we think the Spanish flu probably started from um, a, a case that was an, an army soldier, a you know, young soldier. Anyway, it, was, it went through the army really devastatingly. And however, the um, survival rate was much higher in the sanitarium patients than it was in the army hospitals. And uh, one doesn't know all the possibilities there, right? I mean, an army hospital may not be the most mm, best place to have <laughs> to get sick. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things going on there. There's, there's injuries, right? Uh, that there's a typical person living in um, a normal life that gets the Spanish flu did not have gun wounds or mortar wounds or other kinds of issues. So I don't want to, to leave that out of saying that the army didn't have as good a survival as the sanitarium patients. But nonetheless, it was much greater than you would have, you would have thought just because of uh, flesh wounds, et cetera. Okay, you can read that paper yourself if you're interested in seeing those exact numbers. Here I have another uh, paper that I added today. I just discovered it and put it in. Now this is from 1990, so it's old, but look at what it is. It's prevention of the common cold by hydrotherapy, a controlled long-term prospective study. So what they did in this study uh, that was that they published in physiotherapy, uh, they uh, had two groups. They assigned them to randomly, so it was a randomized study. And one group was, and this was done in Europe, I believe in Sweden maybe, but somewhere up there in the, uh, the, those, that area, that part of the country. Um, and they had a hot and cold contrast shower every day, for five days a week, for six months. So this was their punishment for being in the study, is they had to take hot and cold shower every day during the six months. The other uh, half were told not to do hot and cold showers, even if that was their normal routine. They don't do any of them. So they didn't have any contrast showers, uh, supposedly, during this entire time. 
So what you see here, then, is two charts. This is the f cumulative frequency of common cold in the two groups during the trial. Okay? And this is weeks, so you can see 26 weeks is a six months. So anyhow, and you can see not much difference until here around 8 to 10, 12 weeks, and it starts to be different. And anyway, it ends up a significant difference at six months in the frequency of the common cold in group 2 higher than group 1. All right, over here, cumulative duration of common cold. So the duration of the cold when they got it in the two groups during the trial period. And you can see uh, here, so group one had a shorter duration, right? And this one had a longer duration. So you tell me which group was getting the contrast showers and which one was not. Well, obviously, I wouldn't be showing it to you if group two was getting the contrast showers. Well, I would, but my point is, uh, so you can see here, just having a daily contrast shower can make a tremendous difference in their infection rate and the duration of it. And the cold, the common cold is caused by a virus with much milder symptoms than COVID. Okay, so that Next uh, learning objective is to know some of the simple but effective hydrothermal treatments that can improve COVID-19 and viral infection outcomes. So we're going to talk now about, all right, what are some of the things that you can do using hydrothermal uh, treatment that, have, that we just talked about? So here's the ones I'm going to talk to you about. And the reason is because these are the ones that we teach when we teach our hydrothermal therapy classes in local churches or whatever. So Russian steam bath, we're going to talk about that. Chest fomentations, we'll talk about that one. That one was the one that we sh uh, they had the picture of and they talked about in the study. A contrast shower, I just showed you a, a study on that one. And prolonged hot foot bath. So all of these um, treatments listed there, all four of these, can increase body temperature. Did you know that even a hot foot bath can do that? This key word here is prolonged. If you have a short hot foot bath, it's only going to heat your feet, lower parts of your leg. But if you have it prolonged, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you can actually get a sweat out of just a hot foot bath. All right. So Russian steam cabinets, old versus modern. Um, don't you like, I, I don't know about you. I like these old pictures. It's kind of fun. So anyway, here's a person in a steam bath, a steam cabinet, I'm sorry, and here's the producing the steam and putting it in there. Uh, really wrap that person up. Now, why do you think they have that towel on their head? Well, that is not hot. That is cold. When you give a hot, when you give a steam bath or any of these treatments, you need to have cold on the person's head. And so that is not a hot Towel, that is a cold towel. In fact, I suspect most of the towels around the neck are also wet in cold water. Because you want to keep the head cold so that you can heat up the body only. All right, then what's this thing in the middle? This is a more modern fiberglass one, and there's one where the, she looks quite happy. Uh, so I don't know if she's excited because she's getting warm. It's probably just an actress, and she's smiling because she's advertising. Anyway, I seldom see people in the hot, in a hot steam, a Russian steam bath quite that happy. They're happier when they get out. So, now there's another way to do it. This is the home style. And in our classes, we teach home style as well, because oftentimes you won't have a cabinet. So you can see uh, a chair and, and some kind of a water, hopefully waterproof is ideal. Uh, thing to keep the steam and the moisture in, but you can actually do it with just a blanket or a sheet or whatever. Uh, this, this thing is, of course, going to get qu quite uh, moist and wet. And again, this is the, the cold cloth, and uh, there's no cold cloth yet on this gentleman, but I believe I can see, I'd have to look at the better picture, I believe she's got a cold towel there. She's getting ready to put on his head. So, yeah, so the question was, where's the steam? Because we don't see the little thing with the fire. So what we usually do is put something underneath the, the chair. Uh, I've used a variety of different methods. Um, 
You can get a uh, crock pot, for example, if you've got a crock pot that'll boil water. You can, I've used an electric frying pan that'll, that'll boil water. Anything that will boil water and make steam uh, will work. Uh, in, these, in these devices that um, here, there's a heater built in. This is what's really nice. It, it has an actual uh, place you put the water, and it has a place that heats it, and it has a thermostat with a timer and everything. It's really nice. But you can do these things in the home style, but when you do, uh, it is, you have to uh, monitor what's going on. You can't just uh, turn the thing on and, and uh, sit down and take a nap. You will be very busy. You'll be changing that cold cloth. You'll be watching the temperature. You're going to be, because you can hurt a person. You can hurt someone with steam in particular. Steam is a very powerful heating agent, much more dangerous than a hot cloth. OK, chest fomentation. Um, in a warm bed with a foot bath, OK, there's actual photograph of doing this. There's the hot foot bath. And uh, have a cloth there on the head. Here's a more modern one. Uh, you can see over here is a tub with some water in it. I would imagine that's probably the cold, but I'm not sure. Over here is some water and some towels. So a chest, doing chest fomentations is, can be very, very effective. Um, but it is, it's a high intensity job. You, again, it's just like a Russian steam bath home style will keep you busy. Now, if you have a cabinet, it's not nearly as much work uh, to keep it safe. But the fomentation, chest fomentation, we don't have any automatic machinery that I'm aware of to do this. Although I have just recently heard, and I got to check it out, that supposedly there is someone who's invented a device to do this. And I want to learn about it. But I'm not aware. I don't have the information yet. OK, so um, here you, is a schematic showing you what's going on. So you have a, a fomentation on the back. So this one is under the chest and, the, uh, and all the way down, typically, to the waist. And this one underneath here, we typically have um, it at a lower we have more padding on it. You don't want the person to, f to feel burn on their back because all their weight is pressing on it. So we would have two or three layers of dry towel on top to isolate them from the heat. Okay? But you put the really hot stuff on the chest, and, and we put most of the treatment is to the chest. This one in the back is more or less just to, have, to keep the body warm because you do not want the person to get chilled when you apply the cold. So in a, um, so let's, let's see here, do I? Oh, yeah, one other thing on this slide is this is a modern fomentation pad, okay? Um, they're hard to find. Uh, we, we actually make, we have some friends make them for us. Um, so you can, but I have found them occasionally. Contrast shower, okay? So what that is is simple is what it says. You alternate between hot and cold. Uh, you have... What does it say? How many cycles? Three to four. Three minutes of hot, followed by a minute of cold. Now, you can start off the first one with, say, 30 seconds of cold. Um, and, of course, you don't have to go all the way to completely cold water, although when we were training with Dr. Thomas in Desert Hot Springs, we would turn it all the way to cold, and it would come all the way down to 93 degrees. That was as cold as it would get in Desert Hot Springs. Uh, but anyway, so we, it was hard to have a really cold shower there. Uh, you had to instead have a pot of, of uh, water that you had ice in, and then you would pour that on yourself. That was the way to have a... But anyway, <laughs> now I was supposed to have stopped and done this uh, 20 minutes ago, but I want everybody to take a break. I want you to stand up and, uh, and just stretch. Uh, say hi to your neighbor, whatever you need to do. But anyway, let's, let's just take a little break here. I should have done it earlier. Ah. Oh, wow, I'm really stiff. Look at that. I can't even, can't even touch my knees. Oh, too. Yeah. Well, anyway, I just wanted you to have a little break. Um, there's inst we have protocols and instructions that we would give. This is, I'm not, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm just trying to explain. This is not intended to be a lecture on how to give these treatments. 
So um, I'm not covering that thoroughly, but since you asked the question, the que and you can sit down when you want. So the question was, uh, the how hot was the water? As hot as you could stand it. And um, I, we do have classes on this. We do have protocols that we can share with you. You can find it on the internet. Some reliable sources are there. But the bottom line is that you uh, want to take a, typically you take a shower and, and get clean, okay? Now, if you just had a shower, then you don't need that phase. But I always recommend go ahead and start off with a regular shower, use some soap, get nice and clean. Then you start turning the temperature up until you really are, it's hot. Don't go beyond what you're comfortable with. You do not need to burn yourself. But, but turn it up until when you turn it to cold, that feels good. Okay, it's still, as you're going to see in this next picture, it'll still, uh, it'll still get you going. But, but uh, that's how you know that you haven't had the hot enough is when you turn on the cold, you can't stand it. That's, that, then you should have gone a little more hot. Then you go back to the hot, and then this time, you can actually take it even a higher temperature and go for three minutes, and then you go to cold. This time, usually you can take colder and longer. And then the third time. The reason we say three times is because the studies have actually shown that the, you get the greatest effect from the first one, you get the next greatest from the second one, and you get a pretty still strong response to the third. After three, four, five, six, and seven, doesn't really do much more, okay? It adds a little, it adds a little bit, but not much. Not worth doing it. The other thing it says here is high volume. Uh, if you want to have the optimal kind of a contrast shower, you want to have high volume of water, so you're not trying to get underneath a dribble. That won't work. You cannot take a hot and cold contrast shower with a dribble because you can't get warm, can't get cold. Okay, the third and last, and we're just about finished here, is to know the typical results of a lifestyle medicine immersion combined with hydrothermal therapy. So it's very interesting. Uh, this is a, a program that we did at a local church in Berrien Springs, Michigan. And I talked to you uh, last night, the ones that were here, a little bit about this, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So what, what, what did it consist of? So the, the village church there, and you can, they do have a website with uh, videos. They, they videotape everything that happens in that church, especially during COVID. So you can go and actually see videos um, taken during the uh, training program. It was a training program, but it included a treatment uh, program, lifestyle program. So there were 16 health guests, right? And how many physicians were there in that group? Two. Two, Two of the health guests were physicians. There were 12 trainees. These were the people that were taking the training in how to learn to use uh, hydrothermal therapy uh, in a lifestyle program. And three of those were physicians, weren't they? How many of those were nurses? Three nurses. So we had three doctors and three nurses. Uh, and. Uh, that's what we find, especially among Seventh-day Adventists, is that they are very, very interested in learning this in a practical way. Because this is hands-on. This isn't theory. This is actually doing it. So there was a 10-day uh, intensive therapeutic lifestyle change outpatient immersion program. I, I used as many words as I could so you would understand. So this is an intensive lifestyle uh, treatment. It's an, a total immersion uh, from 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Well, maybe we could say from 8 a.m. to 7.30, because not everybody got there. Uh, but everybody got there by 8, because uh, that was breakfast time. So nobody wanted to miss breakfast. Uh, but they were, many of them did come a little earlier for uh, pre-breakfast activity. There were therapeutic whole food plant diet meals. And we used what's known in, in the literature and research as early time restricted feeding that's if you if you go if you go and look up um, as a seventh day admin as you go and look up two meal a day plan you you won't find anything in the scientific literature but if you look up early time restricted feeding you will find research has been published on it because when you have uh, what this is talking about is restricting your meal times to a shorter period of time instead of you know that many people there they are eating time is 24 hours a day and they sometimes wish they were 25 hours in the day. But anyway, so they basically, many uh, modern people in America and first world eat all day long and half the night. So if you restrict that, 
there has been research showing that it improves metabolism. In fact, it's specifically very helpful for diabetes and metabolic syndrome. It really improves the metabolism. So we use uh, what you would call a two meal a day plan, but the research calls early time restricted feeding. Early means you have breakfast and lunch. If you have only lunch and supper, it's called late time restricted feeding. There's research on both kinds. The, the early is better, uh, has better results. So we had two meals a day after the third day and no suppers. But uh, then there's, we use the uh, complete health improvement program videos and live presentations. We have guest presenters from the local area. Uh, we were really close to a university, Andrews University. We had a number of uh, people that were able to help us. We have daily group exercise. And of course, what do we have after every meal? We have a stroll. And they really got into that. I really appreciate it. We had multiple hydrotherapy treatments. Why? Well, because it was a training program. And so all those 12 trainees had taken online courses, classes before the program, and then we had a three-day, I'm going to show you this, but we had three days where they came before the, uh, before the guest, health guest did, and for those three days, we had intensive hands-on training. We had, you know, we were evaluating them, we were teaching them, we were, they were treating each other, and not with mock treatments, but real treatments, and uh, meaning with actual steam, with actual thermometers, uh, all this. Okay, so here is a little schematic that shows the time of day and the days of the week, okay? And um, you can see there's, there's a scheme to this, the color coding. So this, whatever color you would call that, I, use, I thought when I put it on there that it was sort of a uh, pink, but it looks a little, yeah. Anyway, these are classes, okay? This is uh, where we're teaching them something. So there's cooking classes up there at the top and so on, you can see. And what do you see after every lunch, lunch and yeah, yeah, just, just wanted to repeat that, so anyway. Uh, anyway, it's actually on the schedule uh, because it's that important. This is the second and final week, pretty much the same. Um, and then here's what I want to talk to you a little bit about the training. The trainees completed about 20 hours of online coursework. It was from uh, an organization called Life and Health, um, which is, I think, a arm of the of ASI, and it, there are YouTube videos, so uh, you do ha it, it, there's a channel, so you have to have a password key, but anyway, you can buy these yourself, by the way, and it's not terribly expensive to get the life and health course, and then that was followed by the three days I mentioned to you of hands-on training and practice, and then the trainees assisted and performed at least three or more live treatments of each of the four hydrotherapy things that we talked about, and we also taught them poultices, and they had to apply at least three different uh, charcoal poultices during the program. So these guests got more treatment than, than I've ever seen happen in a lifestyle program. I told them they, they were pink and waterlogged by the time we finished their treatments. Anyway, the students have their performance graded um, by uh, um, the mentor therapist. Every treatment they gave, they, they got a, a rating, a grade on it. They took quizzes and exams during their coursework. Uh, the final exam was, it turned out to be two hours that we didn't intend for it to be, but it was a very thorough exam. And uh, uh, they all did well, they passed. They had to have a 75% or greater. So that would be considered a C plus. Uh, this is one of the aspects of the training I think is very important, and we cannot, I have not found out how to give this kind of training without being in person. And that is, we train them for when to use which remedy. So here's, we have uh, the treatments across here with an explanation, and here was different conditions, okay, that you might have a, someone you want to help. And they, they uh, one of their final exam questions was a, this this right here, this table, they were supposed to fill it out. And so they were able to say, I'm sorry the lines don't show you here, there's, there's lines in my copy, but um, the, they would actually say, I would use a contrast shower for this, this, or that, whatever it was, okay? And then they would put an explanation and so forth. Anyway, 
And this was the schedule of the week before the lifestyle program. So you can see the three days, that Thursday, Friday, and then part of Sunday. Uh, and this were the results. I showed this uh, Friday night. And you can see the weight, blood pressure, glucose, insulin. Hard to read, probably. You, you probably can't read that back there. But here's the same numbers in, uh, in a table. And basically, um, it was at 10 days. There was eight days between the blood test only. And, and we had these kind of results. So we were excited. I believe that we saw as good or better results than we do in our typical, where we've done 10-day residential programs. And I wonder if it's because more hydrotherapy actually makes the results better. It would certainly make sense, but I don't have any proof of that yet. Uh, I look forward to doing some studies where we're going to try to find out. Now, I think you're aware that in the Spirit of Prophecy councils to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we've been told that the, uh, the natural remedies are synergistic. She says that we need to do all of them. You can't leave off one thing and expect to have the same results. Like you say, well, I don't really want to change my diet, so, but I'm going to do all the other things. Well, it's not going to work as well. Um, in fact, one statement she makes is that uh, proper diet can do m more good than all the baths that can be given. That was an interesting statement. So proper diet is very important. So everything I've been showing you from the science about hydrothermal therapy is valid, but frankly, proper diet is even more important than that. And the other thing is, if many of these treatments that are, are addressing the uh, benefits to the immune system, what does your immune system need to, to function in a, in a basic sense? It needs nutrition oxygen, which depends upon circulation and digestion. So it makes perfect sense that proper diet, sleep, lifestyle, all make the hydrotherapy uh, much more powerful, able to do its job. Okay, I don't know if we can do this, but let's try, um, I, I know I can't click on it, but let's click on the, the person on the left, uh, the lady, and um, if this works, we don't know if it will, then you're going to hear a, a video of her describing her experience. So this is one of the health guests that was a doctor. And if it doesn't work, then that's all right. I'll tell you a little bit about it, and we'll finish. She was with us as a guest, and um, I didn't know when I first met her that she was a physician working in, uh, I think, So we're not able to see the video. Here. Uh, and had worked oh, for years oh, I'm sorry. You can. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Always love working with doctors, and we had a, a wonderful experience. So, tell us about your experience, please, Lloyd. I don't know if you can make it any louder or not. This uh, program was a life-changing one for me. Uh, at first, I didn't want to come in and to register because. This program is a life-changing one for me. At first, I did not um, think I should come in because I thought I knew what I was suffering. I thought I knew how to take care of myself, and um, we should, right, as physicians. But um, I was encouraged by my friend because I had been struggling with a high cholesterol, and I did not want to take medications. With all the pills that we were taking to increase our immunity for COVID, I did not want to add two or more to those, okay? So I thought, okay, I'd like to try this. Before that, I was taking something also for the uh, medication for this, but it only um, reduced my cholesterol for a time, and then it went up again. I uh, am very uh, active, and I like to do sports, different kinds of sports. And I thought that would do it. But so I thought, okay, I am going to join this and see what will happen with my cholesterol. So I registered. They took our blood the first, uh, the first day. And um, they said they would repeat it eight, eight days afterwards. And I thought, eight days? What is going to happen within eight days, you know? So they fed us good food. I even learned how to eat beans in the morning. I, I just <laughs> to eat that. That was new to me. And um, 
very uh, nutritious food, uh, at first you have to um, kind of be in the, in the thought of really wanting to eat what they serve, because that's not really exactly like what you do every day, eat every day at home. But I thought, okay, we have to prove that this is going to work, because nothing else worked anyway. Um, they did hydrotherapy, they did all the treatments uh, they could, and they have an excellent, excellent team that uh, um, took care of us. And I just want to thank uh, uh, the use of your uh, very beautiful facility here, open to the community. This is just great. I was going to attend this in Weimar, but uh, you know we got very busy and we never made it there. But I'm glad this was brought here, right here at home, in our uh, backyard. Uh, so, when the first blood uh, test came back, I was surprised. Not with the cholesterol, because I was expecting my cholesterol to be high anyway, but there was a um, item there that is CRP, and then probably we will explain this to you uh, later, right, Dr. John? Uh, CRP, my CRP was high. That, that is an index, index of inflammation, inflammation in the body that says you're in danger because your something is inflamed in your body. And I, I, I did not have any symptoms and I could not feel anything, so I thought, okay, this must be a mistake. But the next day I was so worried about it, I knocked at Dr. John's office and said, I want to speak with you. And she said, sure. So the next day we sat at the breakfast conference and he listened to all my concerns. And after that, he said, don't worry. After this, at the end of the session, we are going to take your blood and everything is going to change. I looked at him and said, really? And I believed him, but I did not trust myself. I thought, what will happen with these values after eight days? This is not going to happen. Well, eight days after, they drew our blood again. And lo and behold, I looked, I looked at my lady, they gave us these sheets, and I was just amazed at the result. Uh, do you want me to just go through this? Well, just well, if you want to mention a couple, sure, that would be great. great. Very quickly, because if I don't read it from here, I, I could sort of memorize it, but if I don't read it from here, you think I'd be making the figures out, right? Okay. I discovered also that I have a uh, first stage hypertension. My, my blood, blood pressure, pressure was running 166 over 70, 165 over 80. At, At the end of the session, maybe two days, uh, within the last two days, I was running 120 over 70. I even had a 110 over 55 in one of my sessions. And that's surprising. My total cholesterol was 250. At the end, of the, after eight days, it fell to 213. That's, That's minus 37, a 15% improvement. My, my bad cholesterol, that's LDL, the doctor will tell you, was 141 start, and I ended with 124. That's minus 17, which is a 12% improvement. Now, listen to this. Triglycerides, 206. It dropped down to 139. That's a 67 point down. 33% improvement. Now, I was telling you about the CRP, the inflammation index in our body. I had an 8.99. The normal of that is 0 to 1. 8.99, it put me on the range of danger. And anything could happen to me any day. That dropped to 0 0.63. An improvement of 93%. What, what happened? This, this program, program works yeah. if you follow it. It's, it's amazing, amazing what, what God, God can, can do if you're willing to be healed. We are called to be witnesses, but would, would we rather be, would it be rather be better that we are healthy witnesses? God wants us to be healthy. So then, for all of us who... Thank you so much for um, playing that for us. And because of time, I won't, I won't do the second one. Uh, but um, he, this gentleman, um, and you can see these, they're available on YouTube if you go to the uh, 
village SDA church in Berrien Springs and, and look up the videos on the, the uh, immersion. But anyway, he was a student. So she was a physician guest. He was a student and he was a nurse, is a nurse. And uh, he tells about his uh, experience. You know, all the trainees have to go through the program. So they, they, they get the same treatment that the guests do as far as, and, and he had more improvement than she did. <laughs> So some of the best improvements were actually in the students. Uh, and most of those, most of the people, like most of us, we, we, we can't believe we have them. Really? My risk factors are that bad? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. So you can be surprised sometimes where you are. But he too had amazing improvements. So anyway, um, yeah, that's the end of it. I'm, it's, it took us longer than I thought. Um, but we still have a few minutes if you have any um, questions that, I'd be happy to try to answer. I see one in the back, Barbara. I'm curious if you're planning one of these training sessions again somewhere. Well, so the question was, uh, she was wondering if we were uh, planning one of these anywhere soon. The fact is that we are um, working with a church in Oregon that has got one scheduled in October. Um, we've got we're working with a, to help a church in Crossville, Tennessee, but they haven't got a date yet. We're working with uh, the, the village church is doing it again this no, in November. Uh, so that's three that we're working with so this year. We have more room. They only take about a month. Uh, so, you know, we would be happy to fill up more of our time. Um, in fact, I, um, it was funny, we, here we've been in uh, Boone's Mill. My wife and I are sort of, that's our base of operation. And uh, we were there for a while, and I realized, you know, I should have I talked to the local churches and see if they wanted to, us to do something while we're here, uh, because we're kind of waiting uh, for COVID. Now, COVID is opening up some, so we'll be traveling more. But anyway, and that's what led to uh, the invitation to do these, this uh, seminar this weekend. Was, uh, so I'm, um, Sally and I, are happy to do those as the Lord leads and opens doors. I, I tell you, there's nothing as exciting. Uh, Barbara and I have worked together in the past, and so uh, she'll relate to this, but there's, it's exciting as it is to see a patient have tremendous improvement in their risk factors and say, wow, I feel better than I have in 15 or 20 years. It's even more exciting to see a person as a student learn to do this and be excited. One of the most exciting things that someone said to me after the last, uh, the first training session in, in Barron Springs was, she said, you know, you have inspired me. I want to do, I want to do like you're doing. I want to help train people. And uh, that was, wow, that was really um, encouraging. Any other questions? I thought I, s oh. So, um, how long of a period of time were these, uh, was this treatment for? Was it like a couple of weeks? Ten, ten days. days? Ten days. Okay, ten days. And one can, from what you showed us, one can do it on their own. Um, yeah. And, but I didn't hear anything. I heard about, you know, after eating, taking a stroll. And I took a stroll with you earlier. It's not walking fast or anything. What about um, more aggressive exercise? When, like, like for instance, I work in an athletic center. I've got weights around me, so I've been lifting weights. Is it best to lift your weights or do, you know, excessive exercise in the morning before you eat breakfast? Uh, not necessarily after, after a meal because that would be too difficult, right? Is it okay to exercise, like lifting weights, at night? Or Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I didn't hear anything about... All I heard about is strolling, easy exercise after meal. Yeah. What about other exercise? Thank you. That's a great question, Tom. All, all of those questions, let me try to answer them. So first off, the reason that I emphasize the strolling is because that is so important for uh, managing cholesterol and blood sugar. So that stroll after a meal, and most people are not familiar with it, so I emphasize it. But most people are aware that exercise is good and they know they need to exercise. So that's why I didn't emphasize it. But yes, if we were to go back and look at one of those schedules, uh, we would see that there's um, exercise, the, the green on there. I don't even have to look at it. I, I know the green is exercise. And so I'm sure, so there's group exercise basically every day. 
there's individual exercise going on also. So see, um, in these programs, each health guest uh, and each student got an individualized schedule showing at the time of day and where they were supposed to be and what they were supposed to be doing. So if they had a hydrotherapy treatment to give, it would tell them what room and what patient they were supposed to work with. If they didn't have anything going on, they would probably have um, at least twice a day, it would say individual exercise. So, so there was exercise is an absolutely essential part of what we uh, did there. See, here's the first uh, week, and we had exercise. Anyway, so you're right. Exercise is very important. Now to your question about what time of day. It's a very good question. Um, and interestingly enough, the best exercise indicates, best ex the best research indicates that exercise um, in a fasting state can be very effective at burning fat. But if you are high, high, prone to hypoglycemia, you may run into trouble if you exercise too vigorously just before meal because your sugars may be low and, and have, can be challenging. On the other hand, there are people who um, have those symptoms, but when they exercise, it causes their liver to perform what's called gluconeogenesis. It actually creates um, glucose and brings their sugars up. So you just have to you know, experiment with yourself and see. Um, I like to exercise before breakfast. Yeah, I think that's a good plan um, if you're able. It's true that you don't want to exercise vigorously for at least an hour or an hour and a half after eating a meal, okay? especially a, a large meal. Now, if you just ate something, you know, a small snack or something, or you're eating a very light supper, then you might only have to wait 30 minutes or so um, to, to do some exercise. The thing about exercising in the evening, uh, again, it depends on if I'm on a night shift and I'm sleeping until noon or whatever, then in a way my day doesn't start. You know, when it, what, evening is really the middle of the day for me. So, uh, and we already talked about during Barbara's presentation that the ideal period of time to sleep is uh, a couple of hours before midnight and until whenever you, you wake up. But if you're on a night shift, and some people have to work at night, in fact, uh, everybody who's ever had a house fire uh, in the middle of the night is very happy that firemen are on duty at night, okay? So, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to be the last person on the planet to condemn people who have to work at night. Some of us need to do that. But the fact is, there is a health risk. If you work at night, you have a more, uh, uh, your shift work is harmful to your health. And it's just like, I, I mean, um, I guess you know that in the various jobs, there's what they call a differential. Um, if you work certain jobs, you get a higher rate of pay because you're more subject to injury and you might have, uh, you know, incapacitated, you might lose a hand or something and not be able to work. So anyway, they pay a pay differential based on the, the risk of your work. Anyhow, ideally, you want to exercise um, in the morning uh, before breakfast if you're trying to lose weight. If you are simply at a good weight and you want to maintain it, I don't think it matters a whole lot, Tom, whether you exercise before breakfast or, or after. The other thing is that if you exercise vigorously, you will need an hour to an hour and a half for your body to relax to where you can easily go to sleep. There's a, you can actually exercise too close to bedtime and, and you, you just sleep won't happen because your body is still in a hyper state. Yeah. Yeah, and working out with weights is excellent. There's, there's a research showing that there's, uh, if you divide exercise into aerobic, where it makes you breathe a little harder and your heart rate gets up, versus weight that's weight lifting that may or may not make you breathe hard, but you're exercising your muscles at a higher um, percent of their capacity, those two exercises have a synergistic effect. It's actually the ideal program is to do, say, uh, four days a week uh, to do some aerobic and two or three days a week to do weightlifting. And, and so they, they complement each other. So I think that's enough about that. Okay. Uh, a member of our church who is watching online just sent me a message wanting to know if 
you'd be willing to do that immersion program you just described Training here program. here at our church and if you'd be willing to talk with the board about it at the next board meeting sure i i i never uh decline any opportunity to minister uh to god's people in god's church so i'm happy to talk about it uh, it i will say this uh, it is a not a small undertaking it's great fun it's it's fantastic but it is a serious uh, engagement. Okay, who's? Uh, if you just allow me, just a short experience, my experience is about COVID. <laughs> I uh, was uh, tested positive in December, last December. I was in quarantine, and uh, during those 10 days, my wife just prepared for me, for her also, for the children. Uh, uh, onion, onion juice, garlic juice, a little bit, and lemon. This combination, one Oni e Onion, two. garlic, and lemon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these three guys uh, combined, and uh, just a teaspoon or two from every two hours for two days, more or less. I had uh, kind of uh, mild symptoms, like throat uh, irritation, a little in the chest, and uh, I lost a little taste in the tongue. But after three, four days, everything was back normal, and I was okay. Since March, I have been tested negative all the time. My wife nev never tested positive, being with me there, and the children also little. Praise the Lord. Nothing more. Praise the Lord, brethren. Praise the Lord. We have a wonderful light about health reform, yeah. if we follow. And I will tell you also, l uh, this last years, I am using more raw food, like fruits in the morning, a little bit, and the, during the work uh, break time, and the, at the end of the day, in the afternoon, a salad, more salad, and a lot of olives, onion, garlic, Good. Good cayenne, thing. and uh, works, uh, onion, or oh, lemon, all this. And I feel very good, energized. I'm going to turn 70, and I feel like a little boy. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You cheer, it cheers my heart as, as a lifestyle medicine doctor. I love hearing that. Yeah, um, the idea of using some, uh, a, a uh, what would I call that? A, uh, anyway, that concoction, that mixture. Uh, the, I've heard of a variety of different types, and, and um, I think that there's many uh, different combinations that can be helpful. In other words, I, I, I don't have anything uh, negative at all to say about you, that particular one, uh, but I have other experiences with other people that did some different thing and had very similar. So I actually think that it's that is like that. You remember that thing I shared during a worship hour? I said that I, I read that quote to you that says, "We ask for a miracle, and the Lord uh, puts in our mind some simple remedy, brings to mind some simple remedy, and and we do it." And so um, I'm not at least bit surprised that there's many different ways to take some whole food supplement or herbs that would would help. So thank you for sharing. Yes, um, Debbie. I have a question you might not have an answer to. Okay. You know, they all around us, we keep hearing, get the shot, the COVID shot, get the shot, get the shot. And it's really being pushed heavily for, you know, they want like 75% of Americans to have this shot by a certain date and stuff. If a person has had COVID, do they still need to get the shot? Um, like you may not know, you know, I don't know what the implications are on if you are now immune, if you've had it, or should you still consider getting yeah. the shot? Well, um, yes, it, it would be, uh, my life would be easier if I didn't answer that question, but I'm going to answer it anyway, because it's a very controversial question and topic. But as I always do, I'm going to stick with exactly what we know published science, okay? And then I'll give you my personal opinion. So what we know for a fact is that different people, and we've been talking about it already, we, the different people have different responses to this virus. Some people don't even know they got it. Some people literally die from it, okay? I know one person that had it, a personal friend, and was in the hospital three times before he got over it, you know, you might say. And he's and I don't know, it's, uh, maybe he'll be hospitalized again. I don't really know. So my point is, there's very different responses to this virus in different people. All right, 
That's important to answer, to answer your question because you cannot say then clearly that if you've had it, you're immune now because people have different responses. And in order for you to become immune to something that you've been infected with, you have to have a good solid immune response that builds the immunity and is prepared so the next time you get exposed, you, don't, you do not get infected. You, it fights it off quickly. You see, the adaptive immune, here's the thing. The, we talked about the innate immune system and how it's the one that works in the first few days, and then the adaptive immune system kicks in. But that's the first time you are exposed to the bug. The second and third and fourth time that you're exposed, if you had a good immune response, the adaptive immune system will kick in immediately first hours that you're infected, the, immune, the adaptive immune system says, ah, oh, we've seen this dude before, and, and the whole you know, army attacks it, and, and it's better. You, have, you, have, you don't even get the infection. So, so if you have that kind of response to the infection, then yes, you would be immune, and you need no, nothing will strengthen, nothing will no vaccine or immunization is going to strengthen that immunity. But if you had an infection and your immune response was poor and you really didn't develop a strong adaptive immune response, you could get infected again. Uh, generally speaking, if you had a, an, if you were infected and you were asymptomatic or you had mild symptoms and got over it, without having to have hospitalization, you had a good adaptive immune re response. Because if you don't have a good adaptive, you will need to go to the hospital. I mean, almost, almost for certain. So, but, now let's keep from discouraging people who went to the hospital. You can go to the hospital and still have a good adaptive immune response. Because there are other things that can make you have to go in. For example, if you already have precarious health, and you get this thing on top of your precarious health, you will, may need to be hospitalized and still end up with a good adaptive immune response. So that's why that answering your question is, is, is very difficult and it, and it can, if I gave a very straight, simple answer, it would mislead some people uh, and so on. So having said all of that, um, there is, in the literature, there is very um, intense discussion amongst experts and scientists about whether or not someone who's had the virus and gotten over it is helped or hurt by having a vaccine. There's, there's p experts on both sides. Some are saying, no, this is not, it, it's only, it's not going to hurt you a bit. And, um, and, in, and if you, you know, if the, their point is everybody would have to be tested to know if they've had it or not. But if we just give the vaccine to everybody, the ones that had it and the ones that didn't have it, that's a lot simpler. Well, it is simpler, but then there are those that are saying, well, but there are people who are being harmed uh, by the vaccine, and, and some indications are that the harm might be greater in those that have had the, vac had the infection and gotten over it. But, but let's keep one thing in mind. You all know this, and that's why I made the first statement I did, that it was the safest thing would be to say nothing. But is, this whole thing has become so politicalized that you really, it's hard to know for sure if what you're reading and hearing is actually true or not. And it's kind of sad, but the facts seem to be that even the CDC has been a little political in the way they've responded. So uh, you're kind of on our own in a way. So it's a good question. Um, I would say that, well, all right, I, I, I'll say this. So what I'm planning to do is uh, I don't know if I've had it or not. I did have an infection um, that was the worst viral thing I'd ever had and, uh, I, that I recall. I was in bed for four or five days. Um, I had gone on a trip and I traveled and I was on a plane with some people that were uh, not far away and I should have moved probably when I found out that they were coughing and sneezing and all that stuff. But anyway, I didn't. And came home with this really bad infection and, I, and it was worse than anything I've had, and it fit the symptoms of COVID, but not exactly. And it was before the COVID hit the world. So, um, and of course, you may be aware that there are some people who had, it appears, had COVID before uh, December or January when they first announced it. There were some people that were 
having this infection before that. So anyway, because of that, I will um, probably get a blood test to see if I'm immune or have immunity before I take a vaccine. OK. OK, question. question. We're, we're about out About time. if you decide or you decide to do this training, which we were talking about. Yes, do the training program. Is there a limit how many people can participate at that time? So the question is, is there a limit to the size of the number of trainees in a program? And right. there is absolutely. There's, uh, there's a practical limit is to how many uh, trainees can um, get in three of each treatment on the number of guests. So if you have three guests and ten trainees, it's not going to work, okay? Because you can't possibly give all those treatments to three people. That was to be an extreme, of course. So but uh, we had 16 and 12. And it worked out a pretty good balance. So uh, the, the village church was, was actually uh, willing to take up to 20 people, they said, oh. uh, guests, and up to 15 trainees. I was very glad we didn't have that many. <laughs> okay. okay. And I, uh, that, would have, that would have probably really brought us to our knees. We worked really hard. We did a great job. But it was the first time through, it's more work. You know, it's like anything else. The first time you do it, you've got a lot of things to learn. So I would say the first time around a church does it, it should be a smaller group. Okay. But, um, but the thing to keep in mind is you've got to have enough health guests that the trainees can give right. about 15 treatments each. So if you've got 10 trainees, that you need 150 treatments. And if you've got 10 people, that's 15 each. Anyway, yeah. so okay. So if you had ten guests, let's say, and uh, six or seven um, trainees, that would probably work pretty well. Yeah. Okay. I have one more question. Okay, last one. The doctor who on the video. Yes, Loida Medina. Yeah. Yes. You tested her also for inflammation. We test everyone the same way. We test. Every, okay. Okay. But she was the only one talking about it. So yes, she so was, right. Do you ever find out what kind of information she had or no, huh? No, we don't. Um, you see, this is uh, the uh, high sensitivity CRP is a measure of low level inflammation. It's typically, it indicates inflammation in the blood vessels. Okay, if it's above 10, we don't even pay attention to it because that means you have a much more. Uh, you, you, we use the ESR, the sediment, uh, sedimentation rate, to, to measure inflammation. So what I'm saying, folks, in lay terms, because I know Martin is a nurse, uh, what I'm saying in lay terms is that this particular test, HSCRP, is for low level of inflammation. Okay. And hers was at the higher limit. So she had high inflammation in her blood vessels. We don't know why. Okay? Okay. Very possibly diet. But I have seen people who were um, fighting a viral disease, okay. and their numbers would be up. But usually it goes over 10, because that kind of inflammation is pretty severe. Yeah. I really don't know, and we usually don't know. Uh, where I test for that is when we do the second blood test, and it's still quite high. Then we might start looking, OK, what's going on? OK, OK, OK. OK, thank you. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Wow, this is a, you, you've uh, been champs. This is a long day and lots of uh, time. Shall I uh, have a closing prayer? Why don't we do that? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for these amazing bodies. We're thankful, actually, for your, the creation, the natural laws of, of uh, nature. And we are just amazed at how wonderfully and fearfully made we are. Thank you, Lord, for the information that's coming to us from science that is studying these things rigorously and carefully, and we're gaining insight. And, and this can help us to uh, make better use of your natural remedies and to have more confidence in them. I pray, O oh Lord, that the talk I gave today, this afternoon, will encourage each one of us to put you to the test, to use your natural remedies, and pray for miracles, and enable you to, to do what you want to do. You tell us that you, you long to perform miracles. And so we know that we have to follow your instructions, however. Or if you perform miracles with, when we're not following instructions, it confuses, it'll confuse everything. 
So we ask that you will give us confidence, give us boldness. Now go with us the remainder of this Sabbath day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you each again.